Hello crew, this is going to be the second lesson for calculating trajectories. This is a slightly more sophisticated method that can account for a situation where the launch height is different from the landing height. It's going to require that we use the quadratic equation for solving, so hopefully you're comfortable with that. My strategy for today is to briefly go through some of the things that I did on the first video, just to remind you of key points. Then I'm going to talk in detail about a particular function for the height of something as a function of its time. We'll finish with a sample problem, but for now, let's just recap some things from the first video. We talked about how something that's launched takes this parabolic path, and all of these different purple vectors are velocity, so we have a changing magnitude and a changing direction. We said, you know what, let's split this up into two dimensions. We have a vertical, we have a horizontal, I know in the vertical I'm going to have gravity causing a constant acceleration, and in the horizontal I have zero acceleration as long as there's no air resistance. That means that we went through and we took any of our velocity vectors, and we would split it up into a vertical velocity and a horizontal velocity. That way we could envision and think about that for the entire path where I just have a horizontal blue vector happening and I have the red vectors and if we extend the concept you can see that those horizontal vectors are not changing that was the whole idea behind no acceleration in the X direction the vertical is where we have all the action we have these changing velocities because of gravitational acceleration in this particular video that I'm doing I'm gonna really focus on the position of an object as a function of time. It is hugely important that you understand that the vertical dimension is going to characterize how long something is in the air. It does not matter what the horizontal velocity is. It won't change the hang time, so to speak. Simultaneously drop a ball from rest and throw one with an initial horizontal velocity and they will strike the ground at the same time. So here's your reminder of what a quadratic equation looks like if I was using y and x as my dimensions. What I'm going to focus on a lot in this particular video is I want to use time for the x dimension and I want to use a position. Right now I'm going to leave it generic as a y though, but for me it's going to be time that is actually the independent variable. All right, so let's take a look at the functions that I'm talking about. I'm just showing this to remind you that we had a whole series of equations that we could use to describe this stuff. But in this video, I'm focused in on this one, and I'm going to show you why. Here is the equation that I just highlighted. It describes the change in position in the vertical direction as a function of time. I'm going to split up the delta. Remember, that's final minus initial. And I'm going to send the initial position over to the right hand side of the equation and you can see that I'm left with this nice quadratic where I have something that now starts to look like a general function. If I focus in on what's going on I can see that my ax squared term actually has some significance. It's one half the acceleration in the y direction and then my x is going to be my t. Over in the b term, I have the initial velocity, and then my c term is just the initial position of the thing. So let's take a look at this more closely. Here's my general function. I'm going to simplify it by letting the b and the c terms go to zero, and I could graph this up for you. Here I'm showing the a coefficient equal to 20, and you see a, a parabola that's scooping upwards. The physical significance of this, remember that that term, what I've highlighted in green over here in the corner, is one half the acceleration. This is showing what an object would do if it had no initial velocity, zero for its initial position, and it had a positive 40 acceleration. Okay, That's not a good model for something like gravity because we always have a downward acceleration. But what you can see is that if I change that coefficient, it widens out my parabola. And in fact, if I go to a coefficient of zero for A, that is a straight line. So this is a flipping point. If I get into negative coefficients, now I have a downward scooping parabola. That is now a good model for something that has acceleration, like on Earth or the Moon or something, 
where I have a downward pull onto things. And again, as that coefficient becomes a bigger number though, bigger the number, the tighter that scoop is. Look at the B term, that physically is represented by the initial velocity in the y direction. If I pick a random, I'm gonna say negative 10 for my a coefficient, I'm still gonna let c go to zero right now, I can show us a parabola. So what happens if I start to change the b coefficient, the initial velocity? What it physically does is it kind of changes where the start position is on the parabola. So I don't change the shape of the parabola, but I shift it around. And what that's gonna look like for us is that if I always say that at time equals zero, I have to have my parabola at that particular coordinate juncture right there, but I can shift the entire parabola around. And so if that right there was my new start position where the red X is, then it's gonna just look like my entire parabola is gonna shift up and to the right. So let's put some actual numbers on this. If b is equal to zero, the coefficient, no initial velocity, there's the parabola that you're gonna have. This is something dropping from rest. But if I give it an upward velocity, positive 10 initially, it's shifting that parabola. And you can see that it's gonna shift it further the bigger the number that I give. If we look at just one of these individually, think to yourself that I am throwing an object up into the air with an initial velocity of 30, and I'm not using any units as of yet. It's gonna go up for a little bit, starts to come back down. The fatness of the parabola is unchanged because that's the A coefficient that would change that. If I start to use negative numbers, so I'm throwing the object down now, it's gonna just shift the parabola in the other direction. And so again, if I look at just one of these, here's that initial downward. You can see somewhere back in negative time would have that top part of my parabola, I'm starting somewhere on the curve because of this negative 30 initial velocity in the downward. The C coefficient is the easiest one to deal with. It just adjusts the height of the parabola. It doesn't change the shape. It doesn't change where on the parabola you're going to start. It just shifts it vertically. So if I have a C is a negative 100, my parabola might be down here. Notice if I do C is negative 50, it's just moving it up. It should be no surprise that if C is equal to zero, that's going to run into that axis right there. The more interesting stuff usually for a trajectory is what if I'm launching something or I'm dropping it in this case because notice my initial velocity, that's the B coefficient is zero, at least in the Y direction. But if I drop it off a 50, say, meter building, then I can just make my C coefficient 50. That's the initial position. If it's a 100 meter building, well then I just need to make C 100. So now let's see how we can put all of this together into a sample problem. I happen to be a track coach. Let's use a shot put throw here as an example. So the throw is not going to be something that starts from ground height and then lands at ground height. There's some height associated with the thrower. I would like to know how far this thing is going to travel given the initial information that the throw is released 1.6 meters above the ground and it has an initial velocity of 10.6 meters per second at 41 degrees. Just like we did in the first video, we're going to need to split that velocity vector, that initial velocity into components. Now I'm not showing all of the math here, but here's the end result. So I get 7.09 meters per second as the initial upward velocity. Later on, I will use the 8.15, but keep that number in mind for just a moment. Here's the equation I want to start with, and now I want to plug in the information I know. Let's assume that this person's on Earth, and I know that my acceleration in the Y is negative 9.8 meters per second squared, and the A coefficient is half of the acceleration in the Y. So ultimately that'll be a negative 4.9 for me. The B coefficient is the initial Y velocity. That was my 7.09 meters per second number from before. The initial height is just my 1.6, that release height that I gave us from the thrower. So I plug in these numbers and here's my relatively straightforward equation that shows me the height of this object as a function of time. 
If you want to see what this looks like when it's plotted out, now I have units on this thing. You're going to see my initial height at time equals zero, it's like 1.6, and then this thing starts to go up first, it comes back down, and it looks like 1.6, 1.65 seconds or so it's going to hit the ground. I still don't know how far it's traveled yet. What I need to do is I need to know how long it takes before it hits the ground over there, solving for this particular location. Well, that means that I'm going to plug in my zero meter height that I want to know. It's hitting the ground. And then I have to use the quadratic equation in order to solve for time because it's a quadratic function. So I plug in the numbers that I have. Hopefully you're all familiar with this part. And I get two solutions out. I get my negative solution, which we will talk about, and then I get this 1.645 second number. If we go back and we look at this, there's my true value that I'm interested in. That's the one that makes sense. The 1.645 seconds is out there at some point. We can still understand where that other solution comes from. If this parabola was symmetrical, if the object had started from ground level with this mathematical function, that's where the other zero would have been, out in that negative time location. It's just not useful to me right now, but it's a perfectly valid number. Let's go back to this triangle for a moment, just so you can see that I had my 8.15 meters per second as my x component velocity. Now I take that number and I plug in to this nice little equation with no acceleration. So this is a first order equation. I'm going to say my initial x position is going to be zero because that just makes life easy for me. And so now I have the final x position way out there. How far is it going to travel? It's just the vx times the time it's in the air. I plug in those two numbers that we've had before here and I solve for my 13.4 meters is how far this particular throw would go. So I think that's all I have time for right now, but I want to reinforce that understanding that equation, that quadratic equation, what those terms represent and how to set it up is crucial for understanding how to do a trajectory problem. Once you get that vertical dimension all sorted out in your head, doing what you need to do in the, in the x dimension is easy. And so I hope that works out for you. If you think you have everything figured out, let your computer know.